Wade's Hurricane Flying into hurricane, the silver airplane flew southeast in fair weather across the small green islands, colored the lesser Antilles. The sky above was clear and the blue Atlantic below shone in the bright sunshine. But somewhere far out above the Atlantic, trouble was waiting and the plane flew on to look for it. The pilot Harry Hansen was an officer in the United States Navy. With 12 years flying behind him, he stared hard at the sky in front of him and at last saw the first thin clouds appear. He pushed a button and spoke into the radio. We're, we're getting near, Dave. Any change of orders? Officer in the United States Navy didn't usually take orders from a foreigner, but that didn't worry Hanson. He was a sensible man. He liked to fly with men who were good at their jobs and who would help him to get the plane back home in one piece. David Wade came forward to speak to Hanson and look it out at the sky. Already the clouds were thicker and heavier. In a few more minutes the plane would be in the storm. We will take the usual road in, he said. We will follow the wind round in a circle, moving slowly inwards all the time. When we get to the southwest corner we will turn into the center. Okay, said Hanson, but I hope you get all the information that you need. I don't want to do this twice. Wade smiled. Neither do I. He went back down the plane and fastened himself into his seat. The two men who walked with him were already busy. The three of them made sure that everything was safe and that nothing could move. They checked that the instruments were working and the computers were ready. Wade was frightened. He was always frightened just before the plane went in, because he knew more about hurricanes than any man on the plane. Hurricanes were his job, his life study, and he understood too well the danger of flying into those terrible violent winds. The clouds were now black mountains, hundreds of meters high. Gently, Hansen began to turn the plane deeper into the storm. The winds became more and more violent, and the plane shook from noise to tail. Rain drove upwards through the clouds, and lightning filled the sky with a hard blue light. Suddenly, the plane dropped like a stone. Hansen fought against the wind and pushed the plane into a clump. All around the black, blue-black clouds were exploding into different shapes every second. Then, just as suddenly, another wind hit the plane from below, and the plane shot upwards like a bullet from a gun. Hansen's arms aged as he fought the plane. He took a quick look at his watch. Another half an hour before he could turn towards the center, and then another 160 kilometers through the crosswinds before they reached it. In the back of the plane, White and his men were very busy. Although they were beaten and shaken every second by the plane's violent movements, they still managed to do their work. At last, the plane flew into the eye of the hurricane, that strange place of calm, peaceful air in the center of the storm. How are you doing back there, Dave? came Hansen's voice over the radio. Not too bad, replied Wade. More than half of the instruments are still working. I think we will get most of the information that we need. This is a really bad storm, Dave. I will give you a few five minutes, then we are flying out again. It's going to be worse on the way out. And it was. For more than an hour, 
The winds scream it and beat against the plane and try to break it into pieces. White was afraid that the wings would come off, but at last they reached calm air again and the noise of the hurricane died away behind them. Four hours later they were back on the ground at Cap Sarat. As they left the plane, Hansen turned to wait. If I have to fly through another storm like that, I am going to take a ground job. White laughed. Well, that was the worst one that I have ever seen. And I have flown into 23 hurricanes. 23. Hans shook his head. You must be crazy. Back at the, his desk the next morning, Wade began to work on the information about the hurricane. His office was in the U.S. Navy base at Camp Sarat on the island of San Fernandez. From his window, Wade could look out across the blue water of San Diego Bay towards San Pierre, the capital of the island. It was a beautiful picture, bright and clear, in the hot West Indian sun. But this morning Wade had no time to look out of the window. Although he was young, still in his twenties, he was a good weather scientist and knew his job well. He did not like hurricanes and he, this he, new hurricane he did not like at all. When he had finished adding up all his figures, he studied the map carefully. Then he went to see Schelling, the U.S. officer who was the chief weather scientist at the base. This hurricane is going to be a bad one, White told him. Look at these figures. The winds could be up to 270 kilometers an hour. Schelling studied the figures. Not very nice, he agreed. Wait, is the name? What is the name of this one? Wait, look it through his papers. Let me see. H e g k l. The last one was Laura, so this one will be Mabel. She is moving slowly northwards at the moment, but she could change direction at com our way. I think we should... Oh, I don't think she will say shelling quickly. If we look at examples of other hurricanes, the direction will very probably stay north. Mabel will finish somewhere out in the North Atlantic and not reach land at all. I think we can safely tell the weather officer that. I don't agree, Wade said angrily. We just don't know enough about hurricanes and how they change direction. Look at Isabel in 1955. She changed direction seven times in ten days and ended up right in the mouth of the South Lawrence River in Canada. They are good for a while longer, but Schelling had very fixed ideas and would not accept that fact Facts and figures did not always give a true picture. Wade returned unhappily to his office. In one way, Shelen was right. At the moment, there was no real reason to think that Mabel would change direction, but reason wasn't everything. Wade just had a feeling about Mabel, a very strong feeling in the bottom of his stomach. He started to walk through his figures again, looking for something to explain his fear. Suddenly the phone rang, and when Wade answered it, he forgot all about Mabel. Jewel, he said, fantastic, where are you? He heard the warm love that he remembered so well, and his heart jumped inside him. A few minutes later he had agreed to meet her that evening in the one hotel in Saint Pierre. Julie Marlowe, he thought in surprise. She worked for a travel company, and she and Wade had been very friendly for a while. Then her company moved her to the United States, and Wade 
had not seen her for a year, but he had not forgotten her. He, what was she doing back in Saint Pierre? Had she come to see him? Wade began to hope. A night out in Saint Pierre. Wade did not find the answer to his questions that evening. Julie seemed very pleased to see him, but did not seem to want to be alone with him. When he went into the bar of the Grand Hotel, she was talking to an older man with short gray hair and square face. Julie introduced him as John Caston, an Englishman who was a newspaper reporter with a big London paper. Then a few minutes later, Harry Hansen came in and joined them, and the four of them stayed together all evening. Wade was very cross about that, but there was nothing that he could do about it. Carlston was very interested in Wade. Why is an English working for the United States Navy? He asked. I am not English. I am a West Indian, explained Wade. My family has been in the West Indies for nearly 400 years, and I don't work for a Navy. I walk with them. They have borrowed me from the weather office, and I am going doing a special study in hurricanes. What is the latest news on Mabel? asked Hansen. White looked unhappy. I am worried about her, he said. I have got a strange feeling that she is going to do something unusual, but I don't know what or when. She is a bad girl, all right, said Hanson. And who, say Julie, called this Mabel? Hanson laughed. One of these girls. He has got a lot of them. Remember, Laura, a few months ago, Dave, you had some fun with her. And so did you, said Wade, smiling. <coughs> Carlston suddenly laughed. You are talking about hurricanes, aren't you? Julie smiled, smiled, but said crossly, Why must they give girls' names to hurricanes? Why not men's name? Girls' names are easy to remember, said Wade, with a serious face, and so hard to forget. He smiled at her suddenly, and Julie's face went a little pink. Wade began to feel more hopeful, while Carlston and Hansen went to buy more drinks. He asked Julie to spend the next afternoon with him. She agreed readily, and Wade began to feel that the evening was a success after all. During dinner in the restaurant, Julie asked Wade to explain why hurricanes happened. Hansen laughed. Don't start him talking about hurricanes. He will go on for hours. Carlston took out his notebook. I am a newspaper man, said Smiland. I am always interested in information. Well, began Wade. First you need a warm sea and still air. Then warm air just above the sea rises. Wet and heavy and cooler air comes in from the saddles underneath to take its place. Then because the world is turning... This moving air also begins to turn. He borrowed constant notebook and began to draw pictures to show them. Higher up, the warm, wet air meets cold air, and the water in the warm air starts to fall as rain. This also makes a lot of heat, and so everything begins to get hotter and bigger and more faster. The wind are now moving in a circle and pulling off. Outwards, so the air pressure in the center of the circle becomes very low. This is the eye of the hurricane, where the air is very still, but the air pressure on the outside of the circle is very high, so the winds move faster and faster to try to get into the center, and so a hurricane is born. Then it begins to move forward and meets more warm sea and still air, and everything is repeated. A hurricane is a huge heat engine, bigger and stronger than a thousand bombs. Wade 
Stop it and Julie looked at him. Well, I hope Mabel doesn't come near San Francis, she said. When did you last have a hurricane? He asked it constant. In 1910, it hit San Pierre and killed 6,000 people. 1910, perhaps we shouldn't worry about Mabel then, said Custom. And I have heard that there are another dangerous he. President Surrier, for, for example, I have heard that he is killed 20,000 people on this island since he has been president. Hansen shook his head. Surrier is a bad news, he said, but nobody can stop him. They finished their meal and moved back into the hotel bar. Kauston bought them all drinks and then asked, Have any of you heard of a man called Fevel? Julia Fevel said, Wait, yes, he is dead. Serious man caught him in the hills last year and killed him. That was the story in the newspaper, he said, handsome. He turned to Julia and explained it. Fevel was a rebel. But he was very popular with the people here. They wanted him to fight Syria and win, and so become the new president. Constant picked up his glass. I have heard he said lazily that Favel is still alive. Wait, look at him and smiled. He decided that he liked John Caston. Ah, he said, so that is why you have come to San Fernandez, where there is a new Man, there is always trouble. I think it is the other way around, said Custom gently. Where there is trouble, there is always a newsman. The conversation returned to other things, and not long afterwards, Wade and Hansen left to return to the base. As they drove through Saint Pierre, they noticed a lot of police standing at the street corner. There were also a large group of soldiers marching through the streets. Surrier must be worried about something, said Wade. Perhaps Calston's right about Fevel. If it's true that Fevel's alive, said Hansen and Hapla, there is going to be a lot of trouble. Outside the town, the road to Camp Sarat was quiet. All the way home, Wade thought about Julie and about her smile and what she had said and what she hadn't said. He also thought a little about Mabel.